Hey there, I'm Mike Henry, and this is my Procreate 5 demo for the piece I call Faded. Now, this is based off of a photo of uh, Leica Suicide, uh, which was taken by Adam Jones. Um, I'll link them down below so that you can uh, go check them out and you can see the original photo. I'm not putting the original photo here because I don't own the rights to it and I didn't want to like do that and uh, step on any toes. So I'll just link them down below and you can check them out. Um, very cool stuff, so I hope you dig it. Now I wasn't going for an exact likeness here. In general, I don't really like doing likenesses um, or doing like a caricature or a portrait or something. So instead this was more of like an inspired by where I was just trying to capture the vibe of the original one uh, as opposed to just trying to straight up draw like a um, in this exact sort of like pose and look kind of thing from the uh, original photo. So this is called faded because of the sort of gradient of hair she has, the sort of fading between different things. I was originally going to call it gradient, but I didn't uh, want people to think this was a demo on gradients because it's not. So uh, that's where the name comes from. In general, this is something that I've been doing more lately, which is like a color key kind of. Uh, I normally don't do that because since I work in a way where I can change my colors whenever I want to, uh, I don't really have the need to figure out the entire vibe, but I felt like I should with this one. Um, so you can see I then zoom in a bit, like I, I basically enlarge her in the canvas because I thought it'd be nice to have a tighter crop. And now I move into the flats process. Uh, one thing that you'll notice too, if in fact you go and find the original photo that this is based on, you'll notice that my background is extremely different. So you'll see in this, uh, I will go for a vibe that's kind of reminiscent of the original photo. And then at some point I decide that it's not working for me. And I think that the thing that worked really well in the original photo just wasn't really working for me here because I wanted this piece to just have a lot of pop for lack of a better word um, and I didn't want it to be too muted and I think that the overall vibe of it is muted until I start finding some some sort of like new ways to tweak it. I think again the original photo is super cool and that's what inspired me to do it in the first place but then just for me and my purposes once I started working with it it seemed like it would be better to just do what I end up doing which is going to happen really quickly at the end. So I'll just talk about it right now, um, that I wanted to take this sort of subdued, um, well, it comes from the original photos in a real environment. It's like an arcade. I think it's an arcade. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, and uh, I... That, that ends up coming across just like a little bit too muted the way that I try to pull it off in this piece. And I wanted the whole thing to have a stronger sort of like we're isolated on this person and we are focusing on her kind of vibe. I don't know. I feel like I'm explaining it horribly wrong. So let's just simplify it to it wasn't working for me. So I decided to change it when I was going in and trying to pull it off. So right now we've got the, we're starting the flats, or I mean we're starting to get the flats where we want them to be. You'll notice that our hair is a solid pink right now. We will go back in and add the gradient in as a fade instead of use, using a big soft brush instead of doing it with the turpentine brush, which is the main brush that I am using here. That's just because I wanted that part to look it's sort of like the contrast between the rougher bits and then the sort of more polished bits. Like having the flats and most of the rendering be done with the rougher uh, turpentine brush, the gradient then is like this nice contrast of like polish, I guess you could say. I feel like I'm having a rough time explaining this one, but that's that's sort of the philosophy behind it I guess. So now here you can see we've got the gradient in and then we'll put in another one and then another one and this is just done with the soft brush. So if you're looking for a simple brush set to kind of get you going or you're just curious as to what I'm using down in the description below is linked my brush set. Um, one thing too that I've noticed a lot of people have asked is how to get the brushes up and running, uh, how to get them in and the way that I do it is I just throw it into iCloud and then go into um, Procreate and just pull them in. Uh, it's using the Files app. 
Uh, maybe other people have other ways and it's more complicated. I know some people really struggle if they're not in the Apple ecosystem, but then they have the iPad and the and Procreate. But if you're fully in the Apple ecosystem, it's super easy to do. So down below is linked my brush set that I use on a lot of things. I do, of course, dart around and use different brushes from Procreate. Uh, something that I've also been doing recently is pulling back in the original turpentine brush just because it's rougher and messier and I can kind of get that vibe out of it. But um, so I use that brush set that's linked down below for most things, which will include like a pencil for sketching, a uh, ink brush for inking, which I will use in this video as well as the new turpentine brush and like a hard round and then a soft fuzzy airbrushy one. And that's basically what I use for everything. There's also a watercolor brush used that, that's in there, but that's just for when I decide to do a watercolor, which I actually haven't done in quite some time. So the phase that we're at now, we've got everything flatted more or less. There's probably some adjustments that end up getting made, especially like the tattoos, but we're on to the ambient occlusion pass. I'm going through with a uh, light, light reddish tannish. In fact, the part of her palm where you can see some of the shadow there, that's somewhat close to the color that I'm using. And that's set to multiply and I'm painting. Uh, I uh, have a bunch of folders on top that show the different shadow layers. And those are that method that I do where I have these singular layers on top is a uh, link down below. I call it select paint, select clear. And you can check that out. Uh, if you're curious as to exactly how these parts are going. Now something I guess I'll talk about is likeness. So I don't usually do likenesses for a couple of reasons. One is because historically I haven't been that great at them. I don't feel the sort of like flow and sense of fun uh, that I do when I'm coming up with a character completely originally. Uh, that said, I have picked up skills over the years to let me caricature and stylize and do likenesses better. Um, one of my friends, Ryan Jones, who you should try to find his art because he's absolutely amazing, um, he's super good at likenesses. He doesn't do them that often, but when he does them, they're like awesome. And uh, he taught me a couple of tri tricks a long time ago to do it. Um, so those types of tricks have helped me, but... I still don't really get a kick out of it. So when I saw this original photo, I was like, oh, that's really cool. I like that. I like the idea that she had just this long sleeve black shirt on and then her hair was so colorful and she has the tattoos, but the tattoos, you can't really see that much since it's just like neck. And uh, as far as what's visible, there's a little bit on the top of her hand, but you can't see that too well in this pose. Um, but I just liked it. And then I was like, oh, but like if I do something that's referencing it, but it's but I'm trying to not reference it, it's going to look either it's either not going to capture what I'm looking for or it's going to look like I copied it without giving any kind of credit. So instead, I just decided to say, OK, you know what? I'm going to totally credit the original and credit the model and do what I want with it. Um, it's very similar to if you're looking up reference, if you're looking up reference for something because you're trying to design something, you want to look at it and pull from it the kind of information that you need without directly copying it, especially if it's somebody else's work. If you're referencing like a tire on a car, like a photo, that's different. But if you're trying to reference like how did this artist handle this thing? You want to change it as much as you can, or I shouldn't say change it as much as you can, but you want to pull the information from it, but then do it in your way. Um, and so I was trying to do the exact same thing here. I was trying to pull the information and the sort of uh, subject matter that I wanted from it and then do it in my way. And that's how we get where we're, what we have here. Now in the last video, I talked about how to do tattoos. I'm pretty sure I do them almost the exact same way here, so I'm just teeing that up for when we get to it. Uh, the designs that I use here, there's one design that I just had laying around um, of an unused design for a friend of mine, and then the rest of them I just kind of throw on randomly. It's kind of funny because I didn't get quite as much coverage on her as I wanted. I wanted her to be completely like up to the jawline and you can see that in the rough sketch because in the rough sketch it's just like squiggles and colors and like yeah sure move on. Uh, but in this I decided to actually then make like designs and it was uh, I think they're they're fine it's just they're not quite as coveragey as I wanted them to be. So at this point now, we're still moving through with the ambient occlusion pass. Uh, you can definitely 
see that we're getting to the end of it. Almost everything has been addressed. Uh, the last things that will be addressed here is the hair, uh, since those are, I believe, on the topmost layers. Yeah, right there. You can see here now, we've lowered the opacity on that chunk of hair so that we can paint it in. And now we're doing some AO on that. Now we clear the bigger chunk and we do the AO here. The way my shadows are set up for the hair is that I'm using an AO pass to do the biggest chunks of hair. And then I'll do another shadow layer where I actually put in the, the lines, the sort of like sub chunks, I guess you can say. Now we're going to move on to those sub chunks you can see happening there. Uh, the way that I usually paint these is I kind of just draw them like a line and then I go in and I smudge them for a couple reasons. One is I soften them a bit and the other is that I kind of blur them together in spots to denote more of like the shadow action that's happening there. You can see for instance in those two lines that are right above her right eyebrow, um, there's darkening in between there and that's because the way that I've smudged them is I've smudged them together so that they maintain some of that harder edge but then we get a little bit of shadowing happening between them. So I'm basically going in and drawing a line and then I'm pushing and pulling it in directions that I need to communicate the form a little bit more. And that means that in some areas it will actually create more of a shadow and in other ways, in other areas, it'll just kind of soften it or reduce its definition a little bit so that its definition is equal to everything else. It's kind of like textile density. If you understand uh, what I'm talking about with textile density, it's like I don't want the level of visual information to be higher and sharper for some things and less for other things or it feels like it's like an accident. For those of you who don't understand textile density, it's kind of like if imagine if you had a, an image that was like all painted at resolution and then you brought in like I don't know some sort of image that you wanted to be stretched somewhere and then you never up it or repainted it and it was just this like blurred out distorted thing and then everything else is like painted sharply. Just trying to maintain consistency. So now we're doing the shadow. She's basically lit from like right in front of her and a little to the right and top. Uh, but the point is, is that it's like a really tight cast shadow, uh, trying to almost like, it's almost like there's like a flashlight shine on her, sh shined, shown. There is a flashlight. Let's go with, there is a flashlight shining on her. And um, that's how it's uh, creating that shadow. It's kind of like a cool look because it, it feels, I've done this before in other pieces, but it feels almost like a photograph being taken because the flash creates those immediate shadows.
So now we're starting the lighting process. And by lighting, I mean we've technically been working with lighting this whole time, but I mean the actual lighter um, values. We're doing this with a very desaturated blue, um, very bright and very desaturated. And then we are, as you can see right there, smearing it into submission, as well as adjusting its opacity to be what we need it to be. Uh, the opacity adjustments already happened, although of course I will monitor that and adjust it more as I go, but it happened at the beginning when I first tested it out. I just usually take a blue streak or whatever color I'm using and I streak it across the canvas so I can see it touch as many things as possible. I adjust its opacity so that it looks good across all of them and then I clear it and start painting. And that's what happened here. So we've got all this definition in her shirt and we are putting the shines into her hair, and then we're working on the face now. second round of highlights has gone in using the same color. I'm just doing it on the hair there and it's fairly stylized. Uh, and then the next step we're going to do some supporting shadows. The first one is right here under the nose. You can see it goes in there really dark and then we lighten it up. And there'll be some other spots here or there that we will uh, do that just to try and help with definition uh, as the image continues. You can see I've already started changing the background color which is usually a sign that I don't know where I want to take that and I'm going to start experimenting. I also did this really thin outline. I usually make it a little bit thicker but I kind of liked the idea of it being thinner to the point to where it, it isn't a complete outline in some spots. It even goes kind of behind the figure. Um, so that's the thought process there I guess is uh, I want it to be really thin. Now we're throwing in the tattoos. And you can see me playing with the tattoo there, just trying to like thicken it up in spots so that the line looks more like it is made for the illustration. Not necessarily that the line is the thickness it would be if this person was real and tattooed, but more the thickness because of what I've kind of established as my thinnest and my thickest in the painting. Of course, this is based on a real person, but she does not have these tattoos. I didn't want to copy any of the tattoos that she had for various reasons and I just went in and sort of made up my own and my own little bits of them here and there. Although they kind of apply, imply a couple of cool tattoo ideas that I was like, hmm, maybe. I described in the previous video when I talked about tattoos, tattoos are impacted by all the lighting so once we turn the lighting back on you can see how they feel like they're a part of her and we'll continue to adjust that as the piece goes but that's the idea there. Um, as for the mess that you see me starting to create in the background, that was me trying to figure out exactly how I wanted to speak to the original photo but change it up a bit um, and just kind of make it like it is this illustration now. It's inspired by but it's not directly the same and so that's what's happening here. Now this starts coming close to mimicking it and you'll start seeing me do some more stuff with the painting as a whole uh, to support this but then 
I gotta tell you, like, already at this point, I'm like, this isn't working that well. Um, so I was starting to think about, like, what do I really want to do with it? Sometimes, because it's kind of what I was saying about not needing to do color keys, if you're working in a way like this where all of these components are separate, sometimes there's a time where you're in the valley of despair and you're like, I don't know if this is coming together. The good news is, is that if you were doing everything right as far as application goes, like putting in the shadows correctly, putting in the lighting correctly, you can always go back and adjust all of these elements, whether it's their opacity or their color or their value or whatever it is, you can adjust them. So for instance, I could very easily redo this whole painting in a matter of minutes to make it feel like it was more like in the daytime. Um, I can make it look like it's more in the nighttime. I can make it look like it's whatever with just a few adjustments to these layers or adding a couple of new adjustment layers on top without having to completely repaint the whole thing. And that's the power of this. In fact, at the end of this, it's not the exact same point, but a similar point. I'm going to show you a couple of the variations that I have on this that were kind of accidental outputs that I thought were kind of even more striking than the original image that uh, I did here. So we'll, we'll get there. I'll make sure that we hover on that for a minute when we get to it. Uh, right now I'm going in and putting in the bounces. Now that I have so much of this illustration sort of figured out, I'm going in and putting the icing. And then that way I can go back in then and... I guess adjust the cake <laughs> afterwards um, and make sure that it's where I want it to be. Uh, so we got a bit of a noise filter on the background, doing some little tweaks here to her eyelashes. Also, I'm adjusting a few other things too. I made her lips a little bit more saturated. I accent her cheek line a little bit more. This is me going back and looking at the original photo now and saying like, okay, how much of this do I want to speak to uh, Leica in the original photo and how much of it do I want to be new? Well, you just saw me there was me saying like, all right, I got, I got to put some like white writing on here. The original was a photo for a brand, which I'll let you discover by looking at Leica and looking at the photographer. But then I was like, I don't need the brand in here, but I need a similar vibe. Like I need some white on the black t-shirt and some things like that. And I liked the fact that I had some stuff going down the sleeves. So in order to make this mine and still be inspired by the photo, um, I decided to essentially create just like a shirt design. It's all nonsense, but I just wanted to like capture that. Um, and since I'm not like paid by the brand or anything, I'm not going to directly represent the brand. So the spirit of this was all just like inspired by the photo. And then there were certain elements that I felt like I needed to make sure I hit just to make myself feel like I, I actually captured the vibe of the photo. This is done using the symmetry tool. And then I'm just kind of making up some random demonic looking skull thing. Because, like, why not, right? Um, and you'll see once I, I think I finish up the bottom jawline, and then I, or the bottom teeth, sorry, and then I go back in and open up those eyes a little bit as well. Once the skull's done, I warp it into place on her shirt, trying to follow, the, like, the form of her body, but then also the folds that I've included in the shadow layer. And then I start going in and hand painting uh, the symbols on the arms instead of doing sorry it's all hand painted but instead of doing it like this and then warping it I just paint it directly onto the shirt thought it'd be fun to throw in just like a little reference to the the eye on the forehead thing if I was going to do like anything just to make it a little mine kind of thing here's some non-symmetrical uh, damage to it and then warp it into place lower its opacity on the shirt, but all of those shadow layers and everything are on top of it, so it will reflect the shadows that I've already created in that little thing as well, in that little symbol or skull, whatever. So then to go with the skull, why not throw in a pentagram, throw in like an eyeball, uh, throw in, I've already forgotten actually what the third thing is, but I just wanted to get those there. In the original photo, the shirt had things like that, and I just wanted to sort of do uh, my own version of those things. I'm waiting with bated breath to find out what the third thing was. I've completely forgotten what the third thing was. Uh, also, you'll notice that I put in some of these like little breaks and stuff in, and I'm cleaning up the eyeball. I put these little lines in because I'm trying to make sure that that uh, level of detail is the same. 
Did I do a hand? I guess I did do a hand. I was going to do a hand, and then I backed out of it. If you go back and scrub back, you'll see. And then I decided to do one anyways. Oh, right, and then I put these little things over it. Cool. So that's more or less it um, for the illustration. But I decide, like, hey, I kind of want to do, like, a version that's, like, a solid. Because see right there, when I turn off all the flats, it's kind of cool looking. So I was like, okay, I want to do, like, a solid version. And so I start doing this where I'll fill it in like that solid and I'm just like oh that's kind of neat uh but then we will revisit that again in a minute I just wanted to point out like what's what's happening there basically so now I jump back to this version of it this original that I was creating we're adjusting things I'm you can tell that this is where I'm like okay brighter dimmer is this working like I'm sort of just playing trying to get it exactly where I want. I go from making it a brighter outline to making it a black outline. And this is where I decide, okay, I'm gonna do lines inside the uh, form. I'm gonna actually, like, like I've done in some of my recent pieces, I'm gonna actually have lines, like cartoony lines, I guess you could say, um, separating some of these forms and accenting certain parts. I just thought that would be a cool vibe. And again, if the original is a photo and that already exists, like I might as well put as much effort as I can into pulling this away from that, because otherwise why do a painting of it? If I'm just going to make it look 100% the same, I feel like I'm not really bringing anything new. So let's just e exploit the medium as much as possible. So we've got this black outline around her, we've got it on her nose, uh, we've got it on her like, jawline and her chin and her distant cheek and breaking the hair and just trying to put it all of these places where it seems like it would be a good spot. So now here I'm doing the chromatic aberration uh, move and I decided to go with this bright yellow background and darkening her with a shadow layer on top and that's how we end up getting this vibe. Um, in all these colors and stuff though you'll see that piece right there that like red version and that's what came out that was really kind of a cool byproduct. So okay here is the final one. I'm gonna hang on this for a minute just to talk about it because there were lots of changes there at the end. I recommend you go back and scrub through that time lapse if you really want to see what happened but basically what happened was I go from making the background kind of this environment this ambient environment to all right we're going pop art we're doing like tangerine background and then I'm darkening her so that she looks like she is more important against that tangerine background she's in shadow she's close to us she's almost like separate from it um, but then that increases the contrast of her to the background or it makes you kind of like look in there a little bit more the way I talk about chromatic aberration back in that piece I did with the lady with the eyes looking in opposite directions, you'll find it in the thumbnails, um, just so you can see how that's done. But let's go and look through the stages. First we have the color key. The thing I find funny about the color key is she looks more like a teenager because she's more like cartoony, and that cartoony aspect kind of like ages things down a bit, which I think is kind of just funny. Um, so we use this color key to then go to this step, which is where everything is basically rendered and we can start playing with it and taking it in whatever direction we want. That next direction is trying to replicate the original photo to some degree. I guess replicate is a strong word. It's more like to speak to, to reference the original without exactly replicating it. And then from there we take a giant leap into this one which is the final look of the whole thing. She's a little bit more in shadow. She's lit by blue against a warm background which kind of gives it a cool vibe. I'm going to talk about the two byproducts we got out of this that I thought were kind of interesting. First we have this one. I don't have the time lapse of it in here because it's not really worth it to be honest. Um, all I did was I kept that black outline that was around her. I think I might have thinned it out just a little bit and I changed the background itself to um, this creamy color. And then all of the flats I changed to this red color. And then all the interior bounces where it's like the skin bouncing onto the hair and all these things, I just made red um, because it's just red bouncing against the shadows of red. And then the rim light that we had in the background, I had match the wall behind her. And it's this cool, oh, and I created the drop shadow, but that was just by duplicating it and shifting it and stuff, um, which I think gives it this cool waxy look, which is also why I eliminated the interior lines because I thought it kind of sold that a little bit better. And then finally, we got this one. I ended up loving, it doesn't look like the original model. It doesn't look like Leica because she comes off as like blonde in this. Uh, the way that I ended up achieving this was when I was in the middle of doing my 
chromatic aberration, I accidentally, or I didn't accidentally, I just stopped in the middle when I got sort of this like purpley uh, color. And I was like, wow, I really like this. It looks almost like night vision, but in red, it's just kind of this really cool vibe. And to some degree, it's kind of my favorite thing that came out of this. Now, I like the final painting as well, but I just thought this was super cool. So I saved it out as a separate take on it, and I thought it was really cool. It's actually been my iPhone background for a while now, and it works really well because it's like nice and dark and muted. Um, so it's just really kind of cool. So I'm happy that I made the accident of uh, that, that one, basically, that take. Usually the happy accidents come during the sketch phase where it's like a stray line and then you're like, oh, maybe I will put a wing on this character or whatever. But um, this time the happy accident happened at the end, which was really cool. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed um, everything in here. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing and I'll see you on the next video. And if you're looking for me on the internet, these are the places where you can find me.